Vielen Dank für Ihre Thank you so much for your presentation. What I remember most is the idea of entrepreneurial thinking by an employee and for our trade unions, for our organizations, a lot can be derived from what you don't like. The catered for employee is not the one that thinks entrepreneurially. This discussion, however, will not be by us alone. It will have Matt Britton, Google Director for EMEA or whatever Europe is, Middle East and Africa and Europe, and um, the name Google. You, you heard your name uh, somehow. Uh, I don't know if it's the connection. It's now the floor is yours. Mr. Tichy, ladies and gentlemen, many, many thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am speaking actually in perfect German, but I'm experimenting with translation technology. So I hope that I explain myself uh, clearly. Now, I'm always excited to be in Berlin. I actually came here first 30 uh, years ago, and I well remember passing through this checkpoint as a 16-year-old and feeling quite intimidated about what lay beyond. Um, I was here for the uh, Weltmeisterschaften in Rudern, uh, sorry, the World Championships in Rowing in uh, 1985, that's 1985, and uh, it was a pleasure to compete for Great Britain. Uh, it was the first time I had raced for my country, being one of the best in my country, and arriving on the world stage, I realized that I was suddenly competing in a different league. And I learned that competing with the best in the world inspires you to try harder, to innovate, and to do better. And I'm going to talk about that uh, today, talk about competing uh, with the best in the world. And of course, Berlin today is so different. Uh, two worlds, better together, joined since 1989. And in fact, I'm going to return to the 1980s a few times during the, uh, the talk and the discussion. Uh, as I talk about the web and Germany, as I talk about the web and Europe, and how they are also better together. Now, it occurred to me, as I was thinking about today, that when I was rowing, I raced for Great Britain, but I raced always in a German boat, a familiar yellow and black boat built by Empacher in Germany. And over 60% of the crews in the World Championships and the Olympics, over 60% of them race in Empackers. I've never won a medal in any boat other than a German boat. Well, it's a great example, sir, isn't it, of why Germany is the world's most successful exporter. Uh, the Empacker boats are so popular with athletes because they are good. You want the best platform for success, whoever it's built by, and we might talk about that. Something else happened that's important in 1989, a thousand miles from here in CERN in Switzerland. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, another Briton, wrote a memo with a very unpromising title, Information Management, a Proposal. Tim was really interested in how humans think and organize information and how different that was from the way computers then uh, did that very same task. A top-down, hierarchical, filing-based approach. And Tim invented a new approach where anybody could add anything to the net of information, to the web of information. And of course, mirroring the way our brains work in an open way is exactly what's at the heart of the web. This was the beginning of that revolution. And I was struck. Uh, reading uh, the contents of some of the books by Ludwig Erhardt, uh, Prosperity Through Competition. And the very final part of the very final chapter talks about the oncoming of a new industrial revolution. So I want to talk a little bit ab about that. This is Tim Berners-Lee at the London Olympics. And um, he sends a message, this is for everyone. Prosperity for everyone, welfare uh, for everyone. Today, many of us take for granted. May I just ask you for a moment, how many of you, could you raise your hand or say, ya, yeah, if you have the entire internet in your pocket? Ya? Yeah? Most people have the entire internet in their pocket, maybe in two pockets for some of you. And we take it for granted already. I want to talk about how the web has already been an overwhelmingly positive force for the economy and for society and that we're only at the beginning uh, of this journey. We have now um, fewer than 3 billion people online. In fact, we'll, we'll reach 3 billion people online next year, but 5 billion by 2020. 
And this pace of people becoming connected through devices in their pocket is continuing to change and shape things for the future. Uh, the internet is a real enabler across all sectors of the economy. Um, it's been a sounding source of innovation. It's benefited businesses of all sizes, uh, traditional companies as well as technology companies. In the past, you had to be large if you wanted to reach a global audience, to distribute your products and services globally. And that's just no longer the case. If you wanted to tap into global talent pools, you had to be big, but now that's no longer the case. Uh, the new businesses of the internet can be big, but they can also be the smallest businesses. We see examples of these all the time. All the time, people who are becoming um, what we call micro multinationals, small businesses that can also be international businesses with a very focused offer that can reach billions of people around the world. And the clear clearest reason for the growth is the internet's ability to help entrepreneurs tap into that market, the export market. So if you remember that 30 years ago, you couldn't afford to advertise. You know, try advertising a German cake in every newspaper in every country around the planet. It's not economic. But today, you can reach somebody looking for German cakes uh, in the moment that they're looking for them. And that's a very different model. That's one of the things that's made Google successful, the ability to be found at the moment when somebody is uh, looking for you. Uh, so if we talk about that, it's not just big businesses, but every business today that is a, big, uh, that is a digital business. Um, in fact, small businesses and medium-sized businesses that are using the web, uh, that have online marketing like Google's AdWords or other forms of online marketing, small businesses using that are growing four times faster than those that aren't. Uh, just like Mpacker's boats, Google can be a platform for success here. Why not use a platform that's working for other people? Uh, let me give you uh, one example. I mentioned uh, German baking, and there's a great company called Kristollen aus Dresden, a family business. And for 40 years, it was one local shop until they decided to go online and see who was out there looking for their products and services. And they discovered through Google that half a million searches a year happen around the world for Kristollen, half a million searches. And so today, they can connect with those half a million searches, and today they export to Japan, to Mexico, to Canada, and to more and more places. As a result, they've doubled the size of their business. They're employing more people, and they're an export success story, something that would never have been possible for a family bakery in Dresden uh, in 1989. So entrepreneurs in the digital economy are also driving job creation. Another example uh, locally here, this is Booker Tiger, which supplies cleaners to homes and businesses in Germany. They launched uh, just less than a year ago, and they already employ more than 30 people. They're growing very fast, and 90% of their marketing is online. And with Google AdWords, they use the platform uh, right from the start. It's been so successful, they've actually had to slow down their marketing efforts because they can't cope with the demand as they add more people to their network. So they've suspended advertising in some cities whilst they, uh, whilst they build. It's not just the Ubers of this world that are able to do that. It's also basic businesses, everyday businesses uh, in Germany like uh, Booker Tiger. Uh, and um, these companies, being entrepreneurial, are also creating jobs. They're creating faster uh, jobs faster than uh, they lose jobs. In fact, uh, for every job created in this field, uh, every job lost in this field, sorry, 2.6 are created. So the ratio there is, is about the entrepreneurs inventing and creating a uh, new business. And for every high-tech job created, uh, four additional non-tech high-tech jobs are also uh, created. So uh, Google products are also shown to be good for jobs. Uh, the German Institute for the Economy reported that uh, Google products helped create 28,000 companies and 100,000 jobs in Germany over the last four years. So we're really seeing this platform success, just like the Mpacker boat, uh, being helpful to many people. Uh, the internet is also good for exports. I've mentioned uh, that with the earlier example. Um, uh, there's a cuckoo clock there as well, which I didn't talk about. So take uh, Gerhard Schmeider, who make cuckoo clocks in the Black Forest. And thanks to AdWords, he can export these beautiful and they're handmade clocks to the US and to Asia. A whole generation of entrepreneurs, from the smallest business to the largest business, are able to connect with this global audience, a global audience that's going to grow by 2 billion uh, by 2020. 
So we started this initiative, uh, Weltweit Wachsen, last uh, year to encourage German small businesses and medium-sized businesses to think about this possibility to go international straight away. And in partnership with DHL, in partnership with PayPal, in partnership with Commerzbank and others, we've had 650,000 unique visitors looking at the tools online and creating almost 300,000 export plans. This is a real time uh, of opportunity. The internet is also good for uh, culture. Uh, we have something we call the uh, Google Art Project, and it works with museums and owners of cultural artifacts to make them digitally available, with their permission, with them retaining the copyright, uh, for people all around the world. And it's brilliant in order to be able to reach people who could never visit uh, your museums. We've got more than 500 museum partners around the world, five in Berlin alone, as well as the famous Deutsche Museum here uh, in Munich, which uh, shows uh, all kinds of amazing uh, art and cultural artifacts. And it's great that Germany's political leaders are now seeing this too. Uh, recently in Hamburg, Chancellor Merkel and six other ministers were promoting what the web can bring uh, for Germany as a society and Germany as an economy. And clearly the phrase industry 4.0 has taken hold here. And it's a German leader, Commissioner Oettinger, in his new role as Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society, uh, who has the chance to set not just Germany but also Europe on a strong path for success in the digital economy in the coming years. And he said last week, it's not just Industry 4.0 that is enough, it's also the future has to be about Economy 4.0, Education 4.0, Export 4.0. And as you can see, I think he's completely right about that. But I want to get to a second point. Uh, what's Google's role in digital growth? Is Google good for the web? Is Google good for Europe? Is Google good for uh, Germany? Now, it's clear that we've been fortunate to be very successful in Germany and in Europe, and thank you if you are using our products and services. We do appreciate it. Uh, and we like to keep working with you to make them better every day so that you'll want to continue uh, working with them. Um, but Google's also becoming an increasingly European-focused company. We employ over 1,100 people here in Germany in five different offices. Last year, we invested 200 million euros here in Germany. And overall, we've got now 9,000 people working across Europe. And we've made 4 billion of capital investments here as well um, over the last four years. So we're deeply committed, not just to Germany, but also uh, to Europe. We really believe in this uh, continent. But of course, with that success comes a degree of scrutiny, some questions, some challenges, and sometimes some myths. Uh, and just like I felt walking through Checkpoint Charlie into the world for me that was rather unknown, I think we all feel a bit uncertain about the unknown world, and it's, it's up to us to explain how we work, and I wouldn't be working at Google and wouldn't have worked for eight years if I didn't feel good about the world uh, that we can help to uh, bring forward for all of you and for uh, Germany. So I want to take an opportunity to answer some of the questions uh, that I hear. Now, one question that I often hear is, you know, does Google have a powerful monopoly in search uh, in Europe. And a few years back, uh, a lawyer uh, at one of our competitors illustrated this point by drawing a picture of an island a little way off the shore, just like this. And uh, he added a dotted line and said, well, this is the Google ferry, and it takes you to the internet. And his point, of course, was that Google was like a ferry because it was the only way to get there, and it could therefore control uh, access. But while we're undoubtedly an important part of the internet, and it's popular to use Google to find things online, uh, information discovery comes in all shapes and sizes, because there are many windows onto the web. There are many ways to get to those uh, islands. And I ask you to think for a moment about yourself. As you try to think about this new world of technology, always start with the user. Start with you. How do you find information on the internet? Do you find it through Google? Uh, maybe also through Amazon, or Facebook, or Twitter, or Zalando, or Check24. Do you find it from your newspaper, from your broadcaster, from your favorite blogger, or if you're younger, from your favorite vlogger? Smartphone sales are now bigger than computer sales, and you're also using apps all the time to connect with uh, the internet without a search in sight. If you're looking to buy a new pair of shoes, you're as likely to go to eBay or Amazon or Otto as you are to Google. In the US, in fact, Almost a third of people looking to buy something now start with Amazon or an online retailer. That's more than twice the number who start with Google. When you want to check the news, uh, you're as likely to go straight to your favorite news sites, Der Spiegel or The Economist or the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. It's why Build, for example, Build gets 70% of its traffic direct from people going straight to Build. Uh, they get 10% from search 
and roughly the same amount from Facebook. And when you think about the world we're in today, the world of mobile, where you've all got the entire internet in your pocket, then everything changes again. Uh, we all spend a huge amount of time in apps. I won't ask which apps you spend your time in. Seven out of every eight minutes on a mobile phone are spent in an app. And some of the most popular apps on iOS and Android include Snapchat. It's only three years old. It's got 700 million photos, uh, 700 million people viewing over a, a billion stories a day. Hugely popular in just over three years. There's a great startup in Berlin called SoundCloud, I'm sure you've heard of. It's built a base of over 175 million monthly users, 175 million uh, since launching in 2007. And they contribute over 12 hours of new music content to be shared every minute. 175 million users uploading 12 hours every minute. Or WhatsApp, which now crossed over, one, uh, over 700 million monthly active users just five years after it was started. So new businesses are being built and born and reaching scale for users, connecting them with information in new ways all of the time. And if you're looking for restaurants or local services, chances are you might go to something like Yelp or TripAdvisor or Do You or Chow or Holiday Check. In fact, Yelp's CEO says his site is rapidly becoming the de facto local search engine. TripAdvisor CEO claims that, uh, that they are the world's largest travel brand. And people are also looking all the time to their friends on social sites for advice and links to this kind of information and recommendation. So the reality is that people have choices and they're exercising them all the time. That's what you're doing. Google operates in a very competitive landscape where the pace of innovation is only increasing. It's constantly changing. And the barriers to entry are really negligible. Think about those examples, Snapchat and SoundCloud and others. A second question. Does Google discriminate against its competitors? Uh, I often get that question about the inclusion of uh, different products and services within search. Again, to understand all of this, start with the user. Start with what you do, what people are doing, what people are trying to do. Uh, now, we know that online, people want the most useful, relevant answers to the queries that they have, the questions they ask. If we didn't provide this, it's just a tap of your finger to go to an alternative, to go elsewhere. And that's especially important on the mobile device, where screens are smaller and typing is harder. So if you think about it for a second, if you search for nearest pharmacy, you probably want directions right there on your phone, not links to other websites where you have to repeat the search. If you want good value digital camera, you want products that you can buy with prices and delivery times from retailers, not websites you have to search again. If you look for a restaurant in Berlin, most often you want to be able to click right to the restaurant near you or click to call a restaurant, not to go to a review site where you have to do the search again. Now, we didn't always do a great job for our users on these kinds of searches. We started with just 10 blue links. But we could tell when we're not doing a good job for a user because a user will come straight back and do a search again or click on a different link. And using that information, we try to make search work better every day. And that's why we began to show direct answers like this, directions to the nearest pharmacy, or uh, make sure that we could see that users were getting exactly what they want and getting it fast. If the user is happier, the site that they're looking for gets a direct connection faster, they're also happier. That's good for everybody. And sometimes our own answers do come out top, like flight results or hotels or weather or news and maps or specialized shopping results. But not always. It depends on the query. And it depends overwhelmingly on the user and what looks like a good user experience based on uh, what, user, what patterns of uh, use we're seeing. So the issue of providing direct answers, I spend a bit more time on that because it is at the heart of some of the complaints that have been raised uh, about Google to the European Commission. And companies like Expedia and Yale and TripAdvisor and others uh, have been arguing that we have deprived their websites of valuable traffic and disadvantaged their business. And what's actually interesting, if you look at the facts, is that the traffic these websites get from Google has actually increased significantly since we started providing direct answers. In fact, it's increased faster than our own traffic. The CEO of Ex Expedia actually said in an earnings call with investors last year that Expedia is seeing increased traffic coming through Google Hotel Finder. So it's not clear that the complaints are uh, entirely uh, accurate there. Uh, that said, the amount of traffic going to other services should not be the main yardstick when you uh, want to judge a success for Google because our goal is to help you, uh, the user, uh, find the most relevant results as quickly as possible. We created search for users, 
We didn't create search for website, we created search for users. And that's the motivation by, behind how we operate and the way we try to improve all the time to give you what you want. Another question, does Google, does Google control too much data? Or put another way, Google knows more about me than my wife. I would say, that's a lovely joke, isn't it? Uh, probably a bad marriage. That's my joke back at you, sir. Um, but it's an easy line to talk about. This is a world you know, where there's a concern that data is like oil. And whoever has the most oil wins. Whoever has the most data wins. But that's really not the case. Let me explain what I mean. Again, start with the user. Firstly, we build everything for users with users in control. It should be clear to you what uh, any data you do with us is used for, and you should be able to control it. And you should have the option to opt out or take your data out altogether. And actually, Germany for Google sets the standard on personal data and personal security. It's understandable. And our engineers in, M in Munich built Google Dashboard. It's a service that lets you review how you use products like Gmail or Chrome or YouTube. If you use our services, you can see exactly what you've shared with us, and you can control everything. You can opt out if you want to opt out. If you want to move all of your data from Google, we try to make it easy. If it's contacts in Gmail or emails or photos, no problem. We want it to be very easy for you to take your data away uh, from the product. And because we make it easy for you to leave, we think we have to work really hard to make the products ones which you want to stay with. And we think that's good for you, and we think that's good for competition and good for innovation. Uh, so when people say data is the new oil, um, and that the more data you have, the more powerful you'll be, uh, it sounds sensible, but it's just wrong because data is not a barrier to entry in this world. It's not the availability of data that's lowered. Uh, sorry, it's the availability of data that's lowered the barriers to entry, the availability of data to more and more people. And data is much more like sunshine than it is like oil. You think about that for a minute. With oil, once I've used it, you can't use it. Once you've used it, I can't use it. But multiple people can use uh, sunlight to power solar panels. Multiple people can use sunlight to grow their vegetables, to grow their plants, to grow their gardens, to read their books and their newspapers, and so on. It's a very different type of uh, good. The challenge is not, then, access to data. The challenge is what you do with the data. It's the recipe that matters most, not the ingredients, uh, when it comes to your online services being a success. And for example, in the field of business, through Google Trends, and anybody can access Google Trends, you can see patterns of searches for different goods and services. That's how uh, the people in the bakery in Dresden discovered that the Japanese wanted to buy Stollen. That's the kind of data that's useful, and that's available to everybody. Uh, we make that uh, data available because we hope that more people will build businesses uh, like that. Um, for example, our translation engine, or Google Trends, or analytics, all of these help people see opportunities and create real value every day. Another question, uh, is Google transparent enough? Uh, this is uh, Webmaster Central, where we provide tools for people who have websites to help them show up well uh, in Google search. But again, if we start with you, start with the user. Users want to find the most relevant sites, and they want to find them fast. So what we do is we do our best through tools like this to help companies present their websites in a way that allows users to find them easily and quickly. In fact, through that site, we've over 600 videos with tips for webmasters and tools that help you to make this happen. And don't forget that PageRank, the algorithm uh, that originally was used to rank pages in web search for Google, was even published as a research paper. So it's wrong to say that we don't talk about how we rank results and, and uh, all the changes that we make in our search engine. Uh, but we deliberately don't publish all of the full details on how the algorithm works. And just imagine what would happen if we did. If we published all of the details, right away the quality of the results would fall, as site owners could game their way through to the top. And that would not be good for users, to put it mildly. We want site owners to focus on having great sites that work fast and they're easy to navigate. And we want to try to find the right result for the user at the right time. A different challenge. If we're sitting here in Germany, if we're sitting here in Europe, it may sometimes feel to us as though the US has already won in the world of the digital uh, economy. And you can understand why they might think that. Uh, where's the European Google? We're going to look at that shortly. Let's just have a look at some of the facts. Here we go. The US has a huge population, a huge number of Fortune 500 companies. 
digital trade surplus that's in the $150 billion range now, and a huge number, 39 startups valued at over a billion dollars in the tech space. So look at that, that's hard to compete with, isn't it? Here's Europe, population of 500 uh, million, uh, 150 Fortune 500 companies, actually a bigger, bigger digital trade surf surplus uh, than the US. We export uh, more online goods and services than we import, and startups valued over 1 billion, well, we've only got 24 of them compared with 39, but it's not perhaps the gap you'd think of in the tech space. This is a strong story. In fact, um, two of Europe's biggest tech IPOs of 2014 were even here in Berlin, as you know, with um, Zalando and Rocket Internet. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of that happening all the time. Uh, so why have we not yet seen the emergence of a European Google or Amazon, a European Facebook uh, or Twitter? Well, I'd argue in part it's because European digital businesses haven't, have been rather handicapped in their ability to grow by the fragmentation of some of the key areas of policy and infrastructure here. They're not starting out thinking about 500 million people to reach. They're starting out thinking about local or national. And fixing that is long overdue. It's not too late. It's not too late for Europe to lead further in digital. But every day we wait, it does make it harder. Think about those two billion people coming read about Alibaba, and you can see what's going on in the world. Uh, with the number of internet users set to double by 2020, we've got everything to play for still. And at Google, we are confident in Europe's entrepreneurs. Uh, that's why Google Ventures uh, launched last year in Europe with a fund of 100 million. In fact, we've already increased that to $125 million, uh, looking to back companies in Europe that are startups and with our investment to bring in other investors to support those with confidence, because that's the confidence we have in European entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a clear sign uh, that investing in European entrepreneurs in this space, we think is good business. And we want Google to be an even bigger engine of entrepreneurship in Europe. Uh, we want to help to match the enormous talent and the ambition of the European entrepreneurs and give them the opportunity to work uh, with the world's largest, largest market, the five billion people in 2020. So we're really excited about joining that investment scene in Europe. Well, if Europe uh, wants to grasp that opportunity, what are the things that stand in the way? Well, firstly, I think Europe needs one rule book more than anything else. Uh, in 1986, 30 years ago, back to the 1980s, the single European Act led to the removal of trade barriers some of them were deliberate protectionist barriers, tariffs. Some of them were inadvertent, like different standards in different countries. That's been crucial in helping Europe's businesses thrive. The creation of the GSM standard for mobile telephones in 1987 happened incredibly fast across Europe, 500 million people, backed by the Germans, the Brits, the French, and the Italians. And as a result, we had a really strong lead with a global standard uh, in that market, and that led to us leading the way in mobile for many years. Now, it's time again to think about that in the context of the digital world. Again, start with you, start with the user. The cars that you drive in Germany and the brilliant cars that you manufacture here in Germany as the Weltmeister of export, uh, they're all going to be linked to the web. All of the German car manufacturers are looking at how do I connect the car in order that it can be more efficient or safer or less environmentally damaging. But under today's rules, Whilst you can drive your car from Germany across the border into Austria, it's not clear if the data that's connected with that car can do the same. A doctor here in Berlin can treat a patient all the way over in Estonia using a video link service hosted in Sweden. But is that legal? Don't we want things like that to happen? Don't we want entrepreneurs and skills to be able to cross borders? Of course we do. But 28 member states and more than 28 rule books for digital products and services, what a burden for an innovative business. An entrepreneur in a big business like Volkswagen or in the smallest business like Kristall and Aust Dresden. What a barrier to competition and innovation. Imagine a startup here in Berlin. You've got to deal with 17 data protection authorities that could potentially claim about your business. 17, and that's just in Germany. That's before you even begin exporting. There's a whole host of other rule books, not just national, but uh, regional within Europe as well. So we do absolutely need a bold, simple, harmonized set of rules in a few areas. Firstly, consumer protection. So people are protected no matter where in Europe they shop, and businesses can sell to that 500 million customer base with one set of rules. 
Secondly, intellectual property and copyright rules, which protect the rights of creators, but without choking off the opportunities. Cross-border data flows. These are absolutely unavoidable. We're generating them every day ourselves as we move around with our mobile devices. By definition, that's an international market. And if we want the benefit of the web as users, and we want our businesses to succeed in the world uh, of five billion connected people, we absolutely need a single European data protection framework. Uh, not forced data lo localization requirements. Now, Neely Cruz uh, said recently, former European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, we need data protection, not data protectionism. And I think she's right. So this is a task that worth, is worth tackling and fast. A single digital market in Europe is a huge opportunity. Reform has been estimated could raise the EU's GDP by at least 4% by 2020. 4% by 2020, generating up to 250 billion euros of additional growth. That is worth having. So as the EU President Jean-Claude Juncker and Commissioner Oettinger have made it a priority uh, to complete the digital single market, let's be optimistic that we can embrace that opportunity during the life of the current Commission. So one rule book, make it easy for people to reach that 500 million and the 5 billion. Secondly, we, we obviously need to skill up digitally. And don't underestimate how much we need to strengthen those skills. On current projections, there is a growing gap between the skills required and the training that workers are receiving. The Europe, uh, European Union itself predicts that almost a million ICT jobs will remain unfilled by 2020. And in Germany, that 43% of businesses are reporting a lack of online skills amongst their employees as a major obstacle to growth. Now, there's much that governments and businesses can do to help address this skills gap. Uh, from supporting exposure to coding in schools to incentivizing digital skills acquisition and retaining those who are already in the workforce. And we're trying to help here in partnership with the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs. Uh, we're on the way to launching uh, training for business professionals in IT security across 750, sorry, across 75,000 small and medium-sized businesses. We want to see what are the ways in which we can scalably train and contribute to that skills uh, that's urgent skills need. So we need a rule book, we need the skills, we also need um, to support and empower our entrepreneurs. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah? Uh, we talk about startups being in garages. Uh, Google was a startup itself, this is the, the garage where Google uh, started. Uh, and actually this is really important because in the last decade, it was the younger companies, those that were less than five years old, that were the net job creators. And it wasn't the older counterparts. So we need to support these young businesses, both by making it easier for entrepreneurs to get started, and then giving them access to resources, financial resources, skills resources, relationships, that can help them to scale up and build their success. Back when Google was a startup, only 17 years ago or so, uh, you know, we have that in our DNA and we're very, very keen to help. We have numerous initiatives to help digital entre entrepreneurs. Uh, many of them are here in Germany. Last year, for example, in partnership with Volkswagen, in partnership with Allianz, and in partnership with 3M, we ran the Founders Garage contest. Over 2,000 people participated, and more than 800 new business models were created, ranging from online radio to tablet computers for the blind. There are people here with the ideas. It's a question of connecting them with the finance, the skills, the relationships, and the ambition. So in conclusion, I'm very conscious being British here in Germany, the world champion of export, the people who provided me with the boats that allowed me to come third behind East Germany and West Germany in the year of German unification. Uh, as a Brit, I stand here and I remember Napoleon famously describing the UK as a nation of digital shopkeepers. And it's not necessarily a surprise, therefore, that the UK is somewhat ahead of Germany when it comes to the digital economy. Uh, eight to nine percent of GDP, the internet economy in the UK, that's people paying for goods and services and access because we're a nation of digital shopkeepers. In Germany, it's three or four percent of GDP, but growing. But if the UK is a shop, then Germany is a factory. And as the world champion of export, you have a tremendous opportunity to be global leaders in the computerization of industry, what you call Industry 4.0. Your industrial core is already well on the way. But as Commissioner Ottinger said last week, Industry 4.0 is not enough. It's also about economy, education, and export 4.0.
Now, it's worth remembering that, yes, this is about the big industrial powerhouses, uh, but it's also about the Mittelstand. It's also about the cuckoo clock maker and the baker. It's about the kids coding, and it's about the entrepreneurs inventing. As Tim Berners-Lee said, this is for everyone. Prosperity through competition, prosperity for everyone. I think that's an achievable vision if we embrace the opportunities of the web. Now, we at Google, we stand here looking forward to working with you, policymakers, business leaders, parents, and everyone. People who can use the internet to enrich their lives, enrich their prosperity. We look forward to helping you harness the web for Germany. Thank you.